who we are the church we have the word of God it's been prophesied about the church we're living right now in the church age the next thing that happens is the rapture the catching away of the church don't forget who you are we're a church body we're God's body we empowered by the spirit of God I heard a preacher say today that someone asked him did he believe in eternal security he said he believed that he was saved and as he looks back, there's nowhere else he can look to. Can you look to anything you've done to be saved? No, it was all God's work. But the Bible said we do need to continually be filled. Every day in our life, we have a choice, and we need to be filled with the power of God, the Spirit of God. It was well populated. The church today should be the most popular place in, the, in your life to be. Is in the church. Remember on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people God planted there to begin the church, and we still are here today. And the purpose was to reach people for Christ. That's why we're here. You know what I'm saying? We're here to, to be able to be empowered by God, encouraged, reminded that we are the body of Christ on earth, and that God's given us power to reach people, soul winning telling people about salvation, then making disciples, people coming to the house of God, learning the scriptures so we can tell other people about Christ. And then there should be a holy unification in the church, oneness. You know, There's only one place you can find true oneness. It's at the cross. It's at the cross. It's not in any other worldly way that you're going to find a true meaning of understanding about oneness is except that we be in Christ Jesus. It ain't got nothing to do with your race. It has to do with your relationship with Christ. The Bible said there's one God, one Lord, one Savior, one body. Didn't say anything about one color. Amen? We're one in the body of Christ and we need to be in the body. And i got an answer today for today's social problem, and here it is. The answer today is salvation. 
It's people being saved. Have you noticed when you get saved, you act different? And then when you get the word of God in you, you your mind is going to be transformed. The things you may have grown up about and heard and said and spoken, your mind changed now because you're living your life according to what the word of God says. This is the answer to today's social problem. It's the word of God. People today are standing up and talking about what the church should do. I want to tell you in my life personally, I think they're about 35 years late. This is not anything new. This has been going on for a long time. Prejudice. White people prejudice. Black people prejudice. Brown people prejudice. Other people prejudice. The Bible said there's one body, never mention the color, and we need to understand. And the true, the true answer today is salvation. I'm talking about a holy, true conversion. People really being saved, not just being a part of the church. And then a good, a good answer today for the problem in our society is to seek the Lord. Seek God during this time. Study the Word of God, the Scriptures. The Bible says you serve the Word of God. In them you will find truth and knowledge and understanding. God didn't save us to be ignorant that we know who we are according to the Word of God. You find it in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to share with you right now from the Scripture, and I'm going to get to my sermon in just a moment. This is an introduction from last week about the church founded, empowered by the Spirit of God. God poured out His Spirit on those early believers, and they were changed. Instead of denying Christ, now they are willing to die for Christ. Now I'm going to give you right now what I believe is the Christian law. The law that God gives to every true born again Christian. Amen. How many of the laws are supposed to govern you how you live and how you act? Okay. And I believe in all my heart this world, this nation, which we live in the United States of America, was established and founded upon the word of God. And the problem in our society is that we've gotten away from the word of God. We get saved, we get trained in the word of God. And then God gives us a law which is manifested by the influence of the power of the Spirit of God. Here is the law for every born-again believer. It will make a difference in our society. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, Goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there's no law. There's nothing that can stand against the fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. If you want to know how to act when the way the world's acting, your law is the fruit of the Spirit. We're supposed to love everybody. The Bible says, how can we say we love God who we haven't seen when we can't love one another? Love God, you have no problem with loving other people. Yeah. Amen. Come on now. I'm not going to charge you any extra today now to understand what we are to be and who we are to be according to the word of God. God has given us the rules, the regulations of who we should be empowered by those fruits, fruit bearing how you live, what you say, who you are, should be, first of all, guided by the love. You've got to love people. Amen? And so we're going to talk today about the, the church that's triumphant. God did not establish the church to be in defeat and to be in fear and uncertainty. But God established the church to be victorious. Say amen. amen. So we're going to look together in Acts chapter 4. Verse 23 through 31, the Bible says in the scripture, and being let go, and he's talking about Peter and John, and being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they had heard that, they lifted up the voice of the God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, 
Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may done by, be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And the Bible said that when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. You may be seated. Father, we pray your word today would not return void. God, we're not here to find uh, some answer. We have the answer. And God, we're not here looking for some new idea, some new a spirit, some new guidance, some, some new direction or some new answer. God, you are the answer. And we trust you, God, and help us today to re be reminded that we are the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the, your body on earth and you are the head. God, give us divine understanding today for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. In this chapter 4, when we come to chapter verse 23, Peter and John, is a, they were boldly and powerfully staying strong in the witness to the Lord Jesus. I told you in the past few weeks, it's a good time to be a witness. It's a good time to be alive in such a time as this that we can be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. There were miracles of healing. A lame man was healed. There was the amazement of the multitude. And then Peter's message that he preached, the, the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This world strongly rejects the Lord Jesus Christ. There was the resurrection of Christ, which is always will be preached when you preach the gospel. And there will always be the reminding to the church of the return of Christ. He is coming back. How much worse can it be? It's going to get worse. Jesus said in the last days, things will be worse than they even are today. There was the impact of the message of God's word. It wooed them to repentance. The Bible said in Acts 3, 19, it says, Repent and be ye therefore converted. And the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. We're talking about the Word of God. You know, when we come to church, it, the Word should refresh you. It should be a good reminder, refreshing of who you are and what we are called to do. Amen. I can remember when you play athletics and you have a day before the game, you kind of run through the plays and it refreshes your mind of what we're supposed to do the next night in the, in the game. God gives us the Word that we can be reminded of who we are, our responsibility. The word of God should refresh us. They were without excuse. As we are, they were awakened to responsibilities. We all have responsibility. Then the Bible said Peter and John began to suffer for Christ. And they gave evidence they had been with Christ and they preached that Christ alone was salvation. Not some other answer. They refused to compromise their witness. They glorified God in everything they did. Now we come here to the impact that we see of Peter and John, the influence of the church. It helps them to have victory. I want you to be today not defeated. I want you to leave here today victorious. That means you're saved and you know who you are and you know God is still God and every man is a liar. Only God's way is ever going to be the right way. Peter and John, you see, first of all, they were released. They were being brought before a people. They were persecuted. But now when we get to verse 23 and 24, they've been released. The Bible said, and being let go, they went to their own company. 
First again, it's important that we understand the true believer will suffer persecution. Don't be surprised about the persecution that comes against the church. Jesus said in John 15, 20, he says, Remember the word, listen now, that I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Listen now, if they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. They don't know God that sent him. If I had not come and spoken to them, they had not sinned, but now they have no covering for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. You think about all the people who call on God and say they know God and love God. You can't say nor know God if you don't know the Son of God and believe and trust in the Son of God that He is the way, the avenue. He's the bridge to God apart from Jesus Christ. There is no God. He's God. Jesus suffered persecution. The early church suffered persecution. The church today is under persecution. Believers today are suffering because of their conviction. The persecution is inevitable, inevitable, and it takes on many forms. It's going to happen. You think about the abuse today of the church and how people abuse the church and, and the anger against the church. They don't want to hear anything about what the Word of God says. Nobody anymore wants to hear what God has to say. They don't want God to be on the agenda. Don't bring God in this thing. Do what you want to do, but don't bring God in it. And there's slander against God and gossip and talk about God. And people use God and they try to tie God in with other situations. It's a mockery to God. Don't try to mix God with man. God is God. He ain't a man. He's God. And they try to mix him up with God and, and the mockery and the cursing. And remember, here's a good word that we have experienced already in the life of the church, isolation. See, the world don't want you to come to church. The world just says it's okay. Sit home and watch it on television. There's something very unique and powerful. There's something powerful and there's something strong about being congregating together, assembling together, in the house of God. There's something about gathering around the preaching and the teaching in spite of the preacher. There's something powerful about being in the presence of the spoken word of God. See, today we're living when thy government and society and, and unbelievers are trying to isolate the body of Christ from even coming to church. Violence. Against the church, it takes place in our churches, our violence in the home, the community, the school, the marketplace. The Bible said in the day which we live, in that day then, we're going to be very watchful. And that word means not just to look with your eyes, but to look with your heart. And to look with your understanding of what you know the Word of God says. We need, what we need is not delivered from persecution, but what we have to have is victory. And over this persecution, let's never forget we have been called by God. God called you and chose you. He elected you. We're on mission for God. We're from God. We're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. The Bible said in Romans 8, very clearly in verse 35, it says this. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? I want you to think about right now where you are and think about our society. Who is able to separate you from the love of God? Now, I want you just to meditate and think for just a moment. When somebody loves you, they are willing to go way out of their way to help you. They will defend you. Amen. Come on now. And when you truly love somebody, they're going to rely on you. All you got to do is open your eyes. And understand that when you find yourself in trouble, there's somebody you can quickly run to. And it's God Almighty, the Lord Jesus, 
who loves you. We were at the beach for a couple of days and the weather was terrible. But anyway, we were at the beach and the boys was in the water and, and the current was bad. The undertow was not good. And it was right on the edge. It's amazing to me to see the force of the ocean. And Elijah all of a sudden was tossed. And flipped, and then he got up, and he, he had swallowed some water. And what really got me was he ran straight to Papa. Because something happened to him that he's never experienced before. But I thought, you know what? That's exactly who you are, God. That when we get tossed and flipped over in the world, we can run to you. Amen. Come on now. We can run to God and God's right there. He just automatically got up off the ground and ran to Papa. Mary Beth said, Elijah, all you got to do is stand up, son. That's what we got to do. We got to stand up. But we do, when we can't stand, there's somebody we can immediately run to that, that will cover us, that will comfort us and that we can find help in a time of trouble. Somebody ought to shout and say Amen. It was God's grace and God's protection that released Peter and John. It, as soon as they were free or let go, they went to the fellow believers. As soon as they were delivered, they went to their own company. They went to church. So my question today is, where is it that you go when you get let go? And what I mean is, when you finish your responsibilities, when you do your job, be with your family, do the things you have to do. When it's all over and you let go, the job hours are over, where do you go? They got together, they quickly ran, and assembled with other believers. God knows exactly what he's doing. And God knows how important it is that the church assembles together. That when we get through working and we get through doing what we have to do, that we run to the house of God. And that we run to God and that we need each other. Seeing you today and putting my eyes on you. And today it just thrills my heart to see other people who have the same confidence and the same assurance and the same power that God gave me. He gave you. You are not here because you ain't got nothing to do. You're here because you've been let go. And now you can come and worship in the house of God. Some people, when they get let go, they got plans. They put other things before God. God is going to be Lord, or God ain't going to ride with you at all. He's going to be number one. Say amen. The Bible makes it clear that Peter and John went where say people go when they get let go to, to the assembly of the believers. Verse 23 said they reported and shared their experience with the church. While we come that we can help one another. Amen. That's what you do as a family. You help your children. We remind them that, you know, don't you go out too far now because you're going to get flipped by a wave. Don't you go too far, son. Don't you go too far, daughter. You're going to go out there. You're going to get in trouble. That's why we come to church because we can experience and share that we went too far and God helped us and God will help you say amen. They were not depressed or discouraged or downcast when they got let go. There was no fear or nor trembling. They had no. Uh, they had been tried by in that day a, a supreme court, but they were not defeated or they neither were they silenced. Can you imagine the day that you will be drugged in front of a court? And they would tell you that you cannot go to church anymore. That you can't speak the name of Jesus anymore. And if you do, you're going to be put in jail. Yeah. These were the threatenings and you're going to lose your family. We'll kill you if you keep on preaching and doing the things you're doing for the glory of God. Peter and John were not puffed up about it. Though they suffered under strain and, and pressure and the witness for Christ, the God used him as a, as a witness to the, the, the high rulers of the land. Yet there was no mention anywhere in the Bible, no suggestion of their boasting about it. 
But being, uh, being God's special servants, they didn't boast about it or, or being moved or, or more used by God than somebody else did. You know, people like that. Some people just glory in the fact that they think that God can do more with them than he can with you. It's amazing what God does. He, he takes the humble and the lowly in the world and lifts them up for his glory. There was no self-glorying for Peter or John, nor conceit or self-exaltation. They were not praising themselves. The Bible said in James 4.10, Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he's going to lift you up. Peter and John were encouraging and they were edifying and building up the church uh, to, to, listen, to warn them of the coming persecution that was to come. It is going to get worse, church. The last days are going to be worse than what you have ever heard of before. Who would have ever thought our nation, our world would be in the condition it's in today? Who would have ever thought that turn on the television at, in family time, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, you see uh, things on television that you, when you were a kid, you could have never imagined of seeing. And it's openly displayed now like a broken sewer right in your eyes. To you and your children, you have to flip the channel because of the things that we are seeing with our own eyes it's going to get worse than it ever has been. That's why your children, my children, grandchildren, any children you know in your family, you need to be in the house of God. Yes. If you're looking around now in our society, it's a young generation. It's a young people who are not even acknowledging God. Yes. Imagine where this society is going to be 10 years from now, 20 years from now. If the Lord Jesus don't come back, imagine the situation that we're going to be living in then. Can you imagine? Godless people. People that have no respect or no fear of God. Verse 23 said, Peter and John reported all. They shared all the court had said, the threatenings, their warnings how persecution would come if they continued preaching Jesus, how God had wonderfully defended them. How many know the Bible said, if God be for you, who can be against you? You know what God's looking for? A fanatic. Somebody that cannot be persuaded or drawn away from the things of God. Somebody that's going to stand firm and, and not compromise but somebody who's going to have a, a face like flint, the Bible says, that you're not going to turn from the left or the right. It's what God's looking for. The Bible said in spite of what the court said, their reaction, you see in verse 24, they lifted their voices unto God in one accord, and they praised God for the privilege to preach the gospel, to be a witness. And they, they prayed unto God for protection and for strength. They were not afraid. The Bible said they were all in one accord, zeroing in on God, his wonderful care, and God's wonderful provision. Church, there's a great power that's given of God when his people unite together in prayer. We forgot what God said about prayer. The whole society is trying to find an answer to unification. There's only one place you can unify and get a, a good lasting result. It's in Christ Jesus. It's in humility. It's at the cross of Calvary. Didn't Jesus say, if my people who shall call by my name would humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from the wicked ways, then will we hear from heaven and then God will heal our land. I'm going to go ahead and tell you this. It's been on me. And I was almost hesitant uh, when to say it or how to say it when I, I get an opportunity to say it. I want to say this with you today. I want you to listen to me very carefully. In our society where we live now, there's a group of preachers, black and white and different colors, trying to meet together soon. And I've been invited, like all the pastors, that they want to march down Main Street for a, a mile or whatever to show unification. That we together as Christians, 
I ain't marching. They missed it a long time ago. You know what I said on the telephone to them? We need to pray. We need to get together and pray. Because I'm going to tell you something. The same people who march one day are not going to be the difference the next day. Just because you march down the street ain't going to change you. If the word of God don't change you, you won't be changed. If you can't love people, marching down the street ain't going to do a bit of good for nobody. we got to pray. When they decide to pray, I'll be glad to go pray. Because the Bible said that we are to get together and pray. And pray to the Lord God and, and ask God for an answer. Ask God for help. Ask God for strength. Ask God for direction. Ask God for an awakening. If I go back to these fruits, if you can't love each other, ain't no way in the world there's going to be a resolve in your society. Come on, friend. Stick with the word of God. I'm not saying I'm any better than anybody else who wants to march. I believe we need to pray and seek the face of God. Ask God to help us. Can't, don't you believe that God can make a difference? I tell you something, friend. The strength and, 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 and the power in the society and what's happened today, the church needs to repent because the church has shied away from our responsibility to be salt and light in such a time as this. We're to say, you know what? The answer is Jesus. The answer is love, that we love each other, that we have humility, that we demonstrate it. And the very same people who's willing to march down the road one day and not let other people in the church the next day. I ain't going with it, friend. I've seen it for 35 years. It's not going to change. The only thing that can change you and me is the power of God the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the love that you can love each other. And care for one another. What in the world has the church come to? Jesus said, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. See, we don't believe what the Word of God says no more. The Bible said if we would gather together, two or three gather together, anything that we ask God believing, we're going to receive it. Yeah. Jeremiah 29, 13 said, You shall seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. Come on now. Didn't God say if you will seek me in the closet, I'm going to re 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 reward you in the open? Yeah. We need to get in the house of God or some gathering place of people of God all over the world and pray. Yeah. Look up to God. Say, God, help us. God will help you. And God will take care of the need. I've got to move quickly here. There was a conviction of God's power. The Bible says in verse 24, when they heard that, they lifted the voice of God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them is. The church today has lost their conviction. Of the power of God, the ability of God. Our God is a creator and a sustainer of all the universe. Our God alone possesses the omnipotent power to create. He's not only the creator, he's a sustainer. Again, just looking at that ocean, all that big, big water. And it came and it had to go back. It came to the shore and it had to go back. It's like God say you can go so far, but you got to go back. You, you ever wondered if all that water just kept on going, uh, more than nickels would be flooded, the whole world would be flooded. But the power of God said you can only go so far, and you gotta, you got to go back. See, God is not only creator, God's sustainer. God is not only your salvation. He's a, a, the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega of your salvation. Where else can you go but to God? He is the only one that can save you and has power to keep what he saved. Therefore, there's no one, no person, no being, no ruling body, no nation 
Not even a, a world that could stand nor stop God's will and God's power. This is the church, God's great conviction. We need conviction of God. Isaiah 42, 5 says, Thus said God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spared or spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and the Spirit to them that walk therein. Job said, and God answered Job, Where was thou, Job, when I laid the foundation of the earth? God is creator and God is sustainer. The Lord in verse 24, Thou art God. There's no other God. Jesus is Lord. He's God and He's sovereign. Acts 2.36 said, Therefore, that all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus whom you have crucified. He's both Lord and Christ. Jesus is God. He's Lord. He's creator. Jesus is Christ, the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's Lord over heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them is. He's Lord over all. This uh, encompasses all the earth, the land, the sea, all the lower heavens, the atmosphere, all the middle heavens, the outer space, all the ultimate heaven beyond all space and time where Christ is seated in the third heaven. John said in John 1, 3, all things were made by him and without him was not anything made that was made. Paul said, for by him were all things created. They are in heaven, they are in the earth, visible, invisible, whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And the Bible said, you are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers. We belong to him that created all things. Jesus is Lord, and Lord means he's sovereign. That means he's master. He's sovereign Lord, sovereign ruler. That means he has the first word, and he has the final word. Come on now. This was the conviction of God's power in the early church. What happened to our conviction? May God have mercy on the church today, the church to repent and and to return to this kind of conviction. I want you to listen to the scripture. And I believe it or not, I'm fixing to close this sermon. The Apostle Paul, with deep conviction of God's great power, said in Romans 8 and 38, Paul said, and this is the conviction that the church today needs. Paul said, I'm persuaded. Paul said, I'm completely convinced. That neither death, nor life, nor angels, 